Fred here. Wanted to post up a quick video today just about uh, the modern militia. Um, so I've been doing militia stuff for about the last 10 years of my life. Um, I started out when I lived up in Alaska. Um, I learned a lot of hard lessons while I was up there. Um, I'd like to share just some of the information that uh, I've learned just through various ways over the last 10 years. But first off, I want to start off with the history of the modern militia. Um, I'm not talking about necessarily the militia from the Revolutionary War or, or the Civil War or anything like that. I'm talking uh, the, the post-90s militia where our, our current modern militia has come from um, in this country. Um, so, as most of you all know, in the 90s there was the assault weapons ban. It was the Clinton era. Um, it was a time in this country's history where um, the the conservatives kind of just felt constantly attacked day in and day out. Um, we had events like Ruby Ridge, which is a video and you know just all by itself how messed up that was. Um, Waco, whether or not you agree with the branch dividends um, on philosophy or uh, or whatever, that was pretty messed up too. Um, talking about men, women, and ch children, um, you know dying in a fiery inferno and uh, there's still nobody that in the in the federal government with the ATF or uh, you know any uh, the FBI or any of those groups that ever got uh, ramifications for what they did at Waco or Ruby Ridge um, so basically there's a, a guy named Norm Olson who used to be the commander of the uh, Michigan Militia Corps um, I've met the man personally. Um, I, I think he's a pretty good dude. He's made some mistakes in the past, just like I have. But, uh, you know, he made a lot of noise back in the 90s. And, uh, you know, he he was even invited to uh, uh, a Senate hearing to where uh, the United States Senate could listen to what he and other militia leaders had to say um, why Americans were so pissed off at their federal government. Um... He ended up moving to Alaska. Again, that's where I met him. Um, but he's he's got tons and tons and tons of uh, literature about what the modern militia is and what the modern militiaman is supposed to do. Um, I'm going to try to put that out there, but I'm also going to add just a few tweaks, um, just my own few opinions. Um, so first thing is, is you know, Norm believes a lot in in public groups I don't so much um, I believe the problem with public groups is that because they're so public just anybody can just walk in there um, you have problems like Timothy McVeigh for example who blew up the uh, uh, the federal building in Oklahoma City um, you know his group personally was a uh, blamed for uh, for making Timothy McVeigh basically. Um, so you have problems like that. I recommend private groups, um, not posting stuff on Facebook, not having social media groups where people can just, you know, say, Hey, this is, this is our group. You can be a part of it through social media, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> also, when you, when you have social media militia groups, um, people start getting really loud and, um, intense in those groups and can cause drama and a lot of times those same people won't even show up to actual physical militia meetings um you know i'm not against having like private message boards within your groups um that way you know you can sit there and share ideas and stuff like that but um just keep in mind that <clears throat> in order to be an effective group you need to physically meet um I always advocate for more than once a month. You know, you need to really be brothers in order to have an effective group. Um, and just meeting once a month really just isn't enough. Um, and and I'm going to talk about, too, just make sure when you're recruiting, you recruit for quality over quantity. A group of two guys that our hearts are in it and they get along is far more effective than a group of 20 people that don't get along, um, have zero training, 
have no intention of getting training. Um, so just keep that in mind too. Uh, so within types of groups, there's defensive groups and offensive groups. And a lot of times I try to recommend just a, a defensive group whose sole responsibility is just making sure that their friends and family are taken care of in a time of crisis. You know, we look at stuff like uh, the lawless periods in, in Ferguson, Missouri, and, and uh, in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And, uh, you know, these groups really just existed to ensure that friends and family and neighborhoods were, were taken care of and defended. Um, and that's what I really recommend. I'm not recommending people necessarily group together, band together in order to go, you know, take on Washington, D.C. or anything like that. Um, specifically, you know, those kind of groups don't really last long and they typically end up with most of their members in prison anyways for stuff that they wouldn't have really gotten into if they just stayed in a defensive role. Um, now people want to get all excited talking about, oh, well, Trump lost and, you know, Biden won, there's going to be a civil war and stuff like that. And, you know, we got to do something. Well, that may be, you know, in your opinion or whatever. But, uh, you know, first things first, baby steps, you need to work on a defensive plan and, uh, and networking with people in order to make sure that your own needs are taken care of first before the needs of, of you know, state and country. Um, as for size, I really don't recommend going over 10 people. Uh, and again, y'all, we're going for quality people, not quantity. So, you know, these people that'll go to like gun shows and uh, protests and stuff and sit there and try to recruit just anybody. You know, it's funny, I actually do classes on this exact topic about you know, founding and coordinating militias. And uh, I had a class, uh, I believe two years ago, and uh, this group, I'm not gonna name names, I don't wanna uh, embarrass them or anything, but they showed up, and before my class even started, they were handing out business cards with their personal names on it, and, uh, you know, and their emails and stuff like that, handing them out to just anybody. And, uh, saying, hey, come join our group, blah, blah, blah. And they're telling us, all these people, there's probably oh, a dozen people there. And uh, they're telling us, you know, approximately where their training area is, telling us how many people are in their group, telling us, you know, what their uh, backgrounds are, um, whether or not they're prior military, prior law enforcement, blah, blah, blah. You know, they violated the heck out of OPSEC. For those of you that don't know, OPSEC is operational security. But, uh, you know, they had no idea who any of us were. They had no idea who the heck I was. You know, I could be the next Timothy McVeigh. I could have shown up to their meeting, taken pictures of, of myself while I was there, and, you know, done a terrorist attack somewhere, and now this group would get blamed for me being radical, even though they had no idea who I was, and I was radical before I even went to the group. Um, so just be careful about stuff like that. I'm not saying don't necessarily join public groups, but... Um, you know, I believe that public groups are a great place to quietly recruit more uh, quality members for your private group. And those of you that are in public groups watching this, I'm sure you're not going to like me saying this. I'm sure you're going to hate my guts, and that's fine. I don't mind. Um, your opinion of me does not hurt my feelings. But basically, again, I, I advocate for staying under 10 guys. Um quite possibly even under half a dozen. And if you get too large, that's fine. You can just split into two smaller groups. And you know, I'm not saying that those two groups can't hang out and be friends and stuff like that, because of course they can. But whenever you have meetings and get down to brass tacks and talk about plans and what you're doing over here and there, um, you know, that's really needs to be done at the smaller unit level just to keep OPSEC. Um, the problem is when you have these huge groups of 20, 30 guys, 100 guys, whatever, there are multiple things that can happen. You can have uh, an instance like, again, Timothy McVeigh with uh, Norm Olson's group getting blamed for that. Um, and that group, because of a few other things as well, basically crumbled um, in the, in the mid-90s. And they're only just now starting to come back uh, with completely different leadership. 
Um, and you know, that was an awesome group. They had great training and, uh, and great experience and stuff like that. So when you have large groups like that, it only takes just a few, uh, pieces to get knocked out and the whole group can come falling down. Whereas if you have just a bunch of smaller groups, even if one group has some kind of drama or whatever and, and, you know, collapses, the rest of the militia body is still there. Um, so as for structure, again, try to keep in between six to 10, um, quality members. If there's any more than that, split into smaller groups. Um, <clears throat> now I also advocate not necessarily having a rank structure. You know, a lot of people get caught up on ranks and stuff like that. And in my opinion, that really just causes a lot of drama within the groups. Um, you know, people saying, okay, I'm going to be captain, you can be sergeant, you can be lieutenant, you can be private. Well, there might be this guy that's over here that's a private, and he might be wondering, well, why is it that I'm just stuck being a private? Um, is my opinion less valued than these other guys? So, you really just need to be careful about doing stuff like that. What I advocate for is coordinators. Um, you know, there's plenty of time in the future where if, you know, the crap was to hit the fan, you know, you can break up and say, okay, what do you think about me calling myself a captain and you guys calling yourself lieutenants and stuff like that? Um, you know, you can always do that in the future. You know, right now, what everyone needs to be worried about is who's calling meetings, who's keeping those meetings on track, and, you know, who's leading that group in the right direction. And you really don't need to have, you know, all these different, this full command structure, especially when you only have six to ten guys, y'all. I mean, you don't need to have, you know, colonels and generals and all this other stuff. You know, that really just comes down to, you know, just, you know, like the liberals like to make fun of us for and say, you know, you're just playing, playing soldier. We don't need to be playing soldier, guys. What we need to do is we need to get serious about this. Um... So, just to reiterate that, just forget about ranks for now, y'all. Just just worry about just getting business done. Um, so, I also advocate, even if you are part of a group, okay? Say you're a group of eight guys, okay? And y'all get along awesome, blah, blah, blah. And someone comes to you at work and says, Hey, Red, you know, I heard that you're in a, in a group. I'd really like to join. Well... Of course, you want to talk to the rest of your group about, hey, this is a person I know at work. He's a pretty good guy. What do you all think? Don't just start inviting your friends and family willy-nilly to these group meetings. That doesn't build trust, okay? Um, and if, you're, if your fellow members say, no, we don't really feel comfortable with that person, that's fine. What you can do is you can become a coordinator for another group, and you can be called what's an absentee coordinator. And what I mean by that is, you know, call you know this friend from work and a couple of his friends to a meeting of just their guys at you know one of their houses or whatever and say hey you know my name is red um i'm part of another group okay so i'm not going to be part of y'all's group but this is the experience that i have this is what y'all need to work on um you should be meeting you know on these days uh you should be doing these things and basically just have a, a meet and greet with these guys and maybe go to one, you know, one, two, three of their meetings over a period of time and just reiterate continually, look, I'm not part of y'all's group. I'm just lending my experience and advising you. This is what has made my group successful, and I want y'all to be successful too. And explain to them that the same thing I'm explaining to y'all, you can't have these huge groups. They can only be small, quiet groups. Um, and the last thing I want to go on is, is guns and gear. And, you know, everyone likes to go and talk about how awesome, you know, well, I want to have these $2,000 ARs and I want to have all this, you know, fun body armor and all this other stuff. And, you know, they'll have no guns at all. And they'll be sitting there saying, oh, I'm saving up so I can buy my $2,000 Knights Armament AR. Look, if you're part of the militia, you need to have just a few things, a rifle, a pistol, and a backpack. 
okay? You need to start with whatever you can get and move up from there. You know, the more money that, that you can set aside, okay, you can take your, your $400 PSA build AR-15, sell that, and buy a better quality AR. You can start with your Taurus 40 cal. You get more money put together, you can sell that and get yourself a Glock. You know, and just keep working yourself up. Don't sit there and get stuck on this, well, I'm saving up for good gear. Because when stuff pops off and you don't have that gear, well, now what are you going to do? Okay? Start with what you can afford and build from there. I'm tired of hearing this whole, well, I'm saving up for, for something good. Don't tell me that. I'm going to call you an idiot to your face. Don't tell me that. I don't care if you got to go to Jibos and buy a, a $120 12-gauge partner pump shotgun, okay? I don't care if you have to go to Academy and buy a $120 uh, Heritage Arms 22 pistol. I don't care, y'all. Start somewhere and grow from there. Um, as for a backpack, you don't even need to have these, you know... $100, $200, $300 uh, assault packs and stuff like that. <clears throat> a simple black backpack from Walmart, y'all. Start somewhere. And, and, and go from there. Um, also, in your backpack, I recommend having <clears throat> what's called an IFAC, an individual first aid kit. You can sit there and buy those for $40, bucks, $50, bucks, $100, bucks, $300, bucks, whatever. Or you can just go to a dollar store and spend 20 bucks, get a bunch of stuff together, uh, put it in a small Tupperware with a rubber band around it, throw it in your backpack, start somewhere, y'all. I don't. I'm tired of hearing this. Well, I'm saving up for something good. There's only a few things that you need to have, okay? Only a few. I know guys that have, you know, all this gear, blah blah blah. But they don't have the bare essentials. What you need as a militiaman. I'm tired of hearing that. Um, anyways, I appreciate y'all for watching. Sorry to sit there and rant at y'all. If you like what I'm talking about, hit, give me a like. If you if you don't like what I'm talking about, give me a dislike. It's not going to bother me. Um, spread the message, y'all. Subscribe if you haven't. Ring the bell for further content. And... Uh, Leave a comment in the comments if, if, if you would like to hear me talk more about this stuff. Appreciate y'all.